At the end of the battle, Yamamoto was said to have said something along the lines of, I fear we will only awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with terrible resolve. Well, that's a great line. Cannon mounted on the front is an 88, as opposed to most other tanks that had a 75 millimeter cannon. That cannon is far superior. Their armor is far superior to anything else. And this is gonna be FDR's headquarters, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's headquarters when he visits the Pacific Fleet. They're gonna build a special bathtub for him. Welcome to another episode of Experts React. My name is Keith Harris. I am an expert in United States military history. And today we're gonna to look at World of Tanks and World of Warships. The Churchill Mark IV. As far as I understand, some of these cannons were replaced later in the war with American cannons. All right, so right here, what we've got is, it appears to be some sort of an enemy position, and I'm guessing there's probably machine guns in this house, and maybe up in that tower right there. Now this tank is gonna be infantry support. So there should be infantry support coming behind it. Those machine guns will make that infantry vulnerable and, and, and open to fire. If they don't take those pieces out, then we're in bad shape here. And here we go again, I see houses off in the distance. And those red marks must be enemy positions. Oh, we're under fire. Look out. I think that historical accuracy is here good. Like I said before, the, the tanks are infantry support. So all those houses are potentially hiding places for enemy machine gun positions. And if you have a German MG42 up in there that fires around 1,200 rounds per minute, your infantry that's behind you is gonna be in real danger. So you need to take those positions out. Who's coming at us from the side? You know what I like about this is you can't see anything around you, so a good tank commander is gonna be up in that position looking all around to see where things are coming from. Positioning is extraordinarily important. If you don't know where your enemy is, you are vulnerable. And these tanks are vulnerable from the side and from the back where the engines are located. The flat pieces, the angle pieces of the tank are meant to deflect around uh, at a particular distance, but the, the flat pieces are much more vulnerable. So you gotta know where the enemy is at all times. If you don't, uh, you're in bad shape. And I noticed in the video, there's lots and lots of crossfire coming from all kinds of different directions. So that would be uh, absolutely key to understanding. I think it looks fantastic. What I love so far about all this stuff is the, is the scenery. The sound quality is extraordinary. You get that boom kind of sound when the shells fire. It displaces so much of the atmosphere around it. It gives you that real kind of thump. If you've ever been close to a big gun when it's firing, as I have been, you can kind of feel the air uh, vibrate around you, and I think this uh, does a real nice job of reproducing that. The scenery is interesting for a Soviet tank. It looks like they're in North Africa. That would have been British and German, perhaps French and American later on. We've got some rock formations. Those are gonna be a significant problem if we don't know what's on the other side of those rocks. Big guns are gonna be so somewhere between a 75 and an 88. The German Tigers use 88. These use a little bit smaller guns, but they have a, an accurate range of about two or so miles. Of course, the farther the distance, the, the less destructive power these shells are gonna have. They're good up close. If you can get up close to an enemy and put around in the back or in the side, or perhaps knock the tracks off, then you're in good shape. If you disable a tank like this, uh, they're extraordinarily vulnerable. But the firepower is extraordinary. And these heavy tanks uh, that we're looking at here have immense firepower at a long distance. They'd also be equipped with one, two, perhaps three machine guns in the belly of the tank and also mounted on the top. Uh, and those machine guns can be great against infantry. They can be great against uh, other positions. What are, we, are we taking fire? Are we taking fire from the front? We are taking fire from the front, ladies and gentlemen. Here it goes. And this does not look good. Mm. Ah. Now this is my favorite tank. Of course, I, I study American history, so this is my favorite tank. It's the workhorse of the American Army. Also distributed the Lend-Lease program uh, to the Allies before the Americans got involved in the war. The Americans are gonna produce tons of these things, tens of thousands of them rolling out of the factories. One great advantage the Americans have in this is that their factories in Detroit and elsewhere around the country are never getting bombed repeatedly. So they can pump these things out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So the Shermans, while they're not the best tank in the conflict, they can put a lot of these things on enemy positions. So let's see what we got. There's a, oh, there's a lot of tanks around. Now that Sherman would have had a 30 caliber machine gun mounted on the top and a 30 caliber machine gun in the belly. It's a five man crew, the driver, a loader, an assistant driver, a commander, that gunner in the front is gonna have access to any troops that they see. A German position, for example, would have had troops entrenched perhaps before that. The Germans could have been armed with something called a Panzerfaust, which is a shoulder-mounted uh, bazooka-type weapon, a tank destroyer. And the Shermans are vulnerable in a lot of places. They're not the best tank, like I said. It's a medium-sized tank, two-inch thick armor, slanted in the front to deflect rounds, but as you can tell, they're vulnerable in the back and the sides. Uh, 
Armor-piercing rounds can rip right through that and kill everybody inside fairly easily. But what they have a disadvantage in terms of armor, they have an advantage in terms of numbers. It's hard to tell where we are. It seems to be some mountainous region, a lot of trees around, scouting for enemy positions. Let's put a couple of rounds out there and see what we got. Come on, boys. But it seems we're reversing out of that position. Okay, we must be in danger. They're taking fire from all over the place. We've gotten ourselves in a bit of a predicament with that angle. If they can hit us with a shoulder-mounted weapon and we're up on that angle right there and they can come in from underneath, we're in trouble. If they're all Americans, yeah, they would come in in a, you know, in a formation uh, at a diagonal with infantry behind them to support that infantry. So these are really infantry support weapons. And so they're kind of all over, but in a battle, things get confusing. This is kind of how things work out. You can start off with particular plans. When these battles take place, they can get confusing, which is what I kind of like about this. You don't know what's going to happen. Now we've got uh, enemy positions coming up. Here we go. Take, are we taking fire? We are taking fire from the side. We are ta oh, that's it. Sherman is done. Now we got a T-34, this uh, smaller Soviet tank. Look the slope sides on this. The tanks look fantastic. They would have had, in combat, they would have had all kinds of things strapped to the sides of these things. Uh, they would have machine guns mounted on them. In some cases, the tank crews would paint things on the side of them to give them their own little flair of individuality, uh, paint designs. They might paint slogans on the sides of them. Uh, they might have things on top of the tanks in case aircraft flew overhead and they'd be able to know what nation that they represented so they wouldn't accidentally be bombed. Are we back in Morocco? <laughs> <laughs> it appears to be Morocco. I am not 100% sure of that. I don't know of any Soviets that fought in Morocco, but ooh, they just took out that building. That again would have been a good machine gun position. And if they're supporting infantry, they would want to take that machine gunner out. This would have been very dangerous for infantry to approach these places blind. So it was good to take that out. In a narrow position like this, this tank is vulnerable from lots of spots. If they don't take all these little things out, a person could come in with a Panzerfaust or an infantryman with a grenade could drop a grenade into an opening, put a grenade into the tracks, knock the track loose, uh, disabling the tank. They could hit a mine. These areas were often heavily mined. If a tank hits a mine, the tank wouldn't be destroyed, but it would knock those tracks loose and render it disabled, making it extraordinarily vulnerable from other tanks and from other shoulder-mounted weapons. This is absolutely Morocco. Tunisia, maybe. Somewhere in North Africa. The commander would be probably perched outside of that shell if he wasn't in too much danger with some binoculars looking around. The drivers have a tiny little slit to look through and the gunners have a tiny little slit to look through so they can't see very well at all. So the person steering the tank is taking commands from the commander of the tank. Most of them had sticks, more like an airplane. I believe one Soviet tank uh, managed to come up with something with a steering wheel, but the, so the, most of these tanks had sticks. The commander would take left stick, right stick, reverse, forward, these kinds of commands to keep the tank moving. So they can't see particularly well at all. They have to be protected. Now, I know this isn't fashionable to say, but the German tank in this particular case is my favorite. I love this tank. It's got the superior firepower. That cannon mounted on the front is an 88, as opposed to most other tanks that had a 75 millimeter cannon. That, that cannon is far superior. The armor is far superior to anything else. The problem with this tank was, is it was enormous, extraordinarily heavy, slow. They didn't go particularly fast. They didn't have much of a range either. They were terrible with gasoline. And when you run a mechanized army, you need gas. Okay, so what do we got? We have a formation, we, no, it's not a formation of tanks. It's a bunch of tanks kind of starting off at the same time. It would be awesome if it was Stalingrad, but I can't tell for sure. Is that an American tank that just rolled by? They should have put a round right into the side of it. They've got the firepower. Okay, so this appears to be Stalingrad to me. I wouldn't be an American since Stalingrad. That would have been a big battle. One of the turning points of World War II was at Stalingrad in 1942. Those German Tigers up against Soviet tanks, some of the Soviet tanks we just saw. Uh, the, the battle lasted for months and months. And from this point forward, the Germans will be withdrawing back through Eastern Europe, back towards Germany. There seems to be enemy positions potentially all over the place. Every single one of those buildings is a threat. I like the way these tanks roll through this stuff. A tank you didn't have a lot of obstacles. Sometimes these things kind of came out of nowhere, and yeah, there would have been civilians around. If they had had time to prepare, the infantry would have cleared out any non-combatant personnel if they could have, but that's not always the case. This looks like a pretty battle-scarred region, so my guess is this is well into the campaign, so not many civilians around, uh, mostly combatants, infantry artillery, and they would have air reconnaissance flying overhead to spot where these, uh, where these guys were. So we've gotten into some city combat, infantry hiding places all over the place. It looks like we have an enemy tank sitting right next to us. 
if we are the Germans in this case, yeah, that's an American tank. It's a much heavier American tank than a Sherman. So they have the opportunity to put a shell right into the side of us as they do. It doesn't seem like they are going to do that, though. I'm not sure if this is Stalingrad or not. This might be somewhere else. This might be somewhere closer to German city. It's hard to tell. It looks very industrial, though. Uh, this is the heaviest tank, as far as I know, uh, of all the World War II tanks, and it's difficult to move around. Okay, warships. Yay, I love these. Amagi, a battleship. I believe this was a design ship. These look great. Heavy cannons fore and aft. These things were uh, something else. A battleship is, would be a, a flagship type ship, a capital ship as they refer to them. A ship that would have been in command. They appear to be somewhere where it's cold. So we're looking good at the cannons fore and aft. These would have anti-aircraft guns on them as well. Heavy caliber cannons. They could fire up to 20 miles accurately. In the Pacific combat, you often didn't see uh, your enemy ship. Uh, you would just be firing at them over the horizon. They would have been scouted out uh, with reconnaissance planes. And they would have radio communications. I mean, it was spotty at best. You know, they go out of range, they go off channel, they do all kinds of things. Uh, and a reconnaissance craft was often unarmed. It could be shot down. They'd be flying off by themselves. That could get shot down. And then they'd be going in blind. You need the reconnaissance, what the cavalry used to do in the 19th century, aircraft do in the 20th century. And so if you lose communication with your aircraft, you're going into things blind. We have an enemy. So that's taking fire from all, it's on fire. Look out. Oh man, they're done for. They're taking fire from all kinds of directions, including us apparently. Yep, that's the end of that ship. Enemy warship destroyed. I can absolutely guarantee that. <laughs> a torpedo is fired from a submarine or a torpedo boat, perhaps, a smaller craft. These are very difficult to maneuver to these big giant ships. You can't just turn them on a dime, you know? For the, they can be rather fast, but as they're moving along, uh, to turn a ship of this size is extraordinarily difficult. And to stop a ship of this size is extraordinarily difficult too. And we're taking fire. Battleships tend to fire broadside, not from the front. The reason for that being is that they need a stable firing position. And if you fire from the side, one of these battleships displaces an enormous amount of water. So you can use a broadside firing for stability because the ship's not going to go very much like that. If you fire from the front, the ship is going to be going back and forth like that. So uh, you don't have as much stability firing from the front. They're capable of doing it. Uh, they can fire 360 degrees practically. Don't fire your own uh, superstructure there. But if you fire, that's the end of the Japanese battleship, it seems. Uh, they are done for. Firing from broadside is the way you want to do it. Like the Bismarck has a very short career uh, in World War II. The Bismarck is going to go into battle in 1942 around Greenland and Iceland and go up against the British Navy. Uh, this is the most formidable weapon, I believe, that the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, uh, developed. They have four big guns, fore and aft, just a big threat all around. There's two of these ships that were built, the Bismarck, uh, named after Otto von Bismarck. Very, very dangerous. And so the, the British Navy was all about taking this one out. It's not going to make it through the end of this battle. It's not going to be sank, though. It's going to be uh, uh, sunk, rather. It's going to be badly damaged in the battle it's about to go into. And the officers will scuttle the ship, which means they're going to destroy it intentionally and sink it so the enemy can't capture it and use it for anything. The Germans were very good at making deadly weapons. Uh, for combat. They couldn't have the capacity to make as many of them as the Americans could. So we are in the North Atlantic. I'm guessing this is the Strait of Denmark. Bismarck, I believe, had 15-inch cannons fore and aft. That's a big gun. And so they are deadly accurate at 24 miles, somewhere in the neighborhood of that. 20 to 24 miles. Now, interestingly, these battleships are coming in very close to the shore. I would think that they would be in danger of running aground also. They displace a, a good deal of water. They're somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 feet long. It's a big ship. Here come some torpedoes. And they're gonna miss. Yep, that one was close. Look out. Submarine warfare could have the potential here to determine the outcome in a lot of cases. The Germans had a great uh, strategy with submarine warfare, their, their U-boat strategy that would hunt in wolf packs and all that shipping across the Atlantic from the United States to Britain to, for war supplies, the shipping in the channel. Any of that stuff around the Atlantic and the North Atlantic was vulnerable to U-boat war and they would hunt in packs, come out of nowhere. Uh, the Americans would employ various tactics to avoid U-boats, including a kind of zigzag across the Atlantic, and they would be protected by destroyers to hunt submarines. This is the USS Iowa, a ship that I have actually been aboard. Uh, this ship is uh, docked currently in Long Beach Harbor, which is not far from where we're filming right now. I've been aboard that. This ship has served in World War II, the Korean conflict, 
uh, through uh, Southeast Asia and Vietnam, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, also served in the Persian Gulf. An Iowa-class battleship, I believe these were first built in 1943 or 1944. This one looks like it needs a little rust <laughs> protection, but yeah, there it is in the Pacific fighting. This is gonna be FDR's headquarters, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's headquarters when he visits the Pacific Fleet. They're gonna build a special bathtub for him uh, in his stateroom, and I've been inside. It's so cool looking. I love being, being able to be on board these ships. I've been on board this one. I've been on board the Lexington, an aircraft carrier that's uh, docked in Charleston. Again, they probably have their, their four cannons aimed forward. The likelihood of them firing that way would have uh, been pretty slim, though they're capable of doing it. They would have pulled broadside if they could and opened up that way. So we have, looks like some, okay, they're firing at an enemy position. Now, as you see here, battleships were often used to bombard the shore in anticipation of an amphibious landing. And in the Pacific, the island hunt hopping campaign, that's the kind of thing that happened. Once the Japanese Navy, the Japanese aircraft carriers were neutralized at the Battle of Midway, the Japanese uh, offensive Navy uh, was severely compromised. And so they're gonna go on the defensive from that point forward, which the United States Army, Navy, and Marine Corps are going to engage in an island hopping campaign. Those battleships would have been instrumental in softening up Japanese defenses in anticipation of those amphibious landings. Places like Tarawa, Peleliu, the Japanese submarines uh, would have been uh, interested in taking those battleships out. Later in the war, Japanese kamikaze aircraft would have been interested in taking these out, as would smaller craft. They had their own version of PT boats that would come into play. We've got, it appears to be a Japanese destroyer, I can't tell, in our sights, and they can, and it's coming way close into the shore. And these coral volcanic islands uh, would have torn the keel out from underneath that ship. So if he gets too close to the shore, he's absolutely done for. But it looks like he's done for anyway because we got him in our sights. Uh, we're close into some volcanic islands, so it would have to slow down because you can't stop a ship this size all that easily. Uh, this one to me seems to be turning uh, fairly easy. I don't think it would be quite as easy to turn a ship this size. If you've ever been on it, you'll see what I mean. The Iowa is on fire, friends. King George saw service in the Atlantic, and if I'm not mistaken, in the Mediterranean, too. These battleships would have been instrumental in the early operations against North Africa, against the invasion of Sicily in the Mediterranean, around Greece, in the Channel, without question. Battleships would have been taking supportive roles in Operation Overlord, uh, Normandy invasion in 1944. Here we go again, very good looking. Even the, even the wood grain on the teak decks looks good to me. So you see on the side there, those anti-aircraft weapons they could use against smaller craft too, blasting away at those. They would have machine gun positions all along uh, the sides there. I think you can see them, yep. Smaller craft approaching uh, would be vulnerable to those and they had the big guns fore and aft. Uh, two in the front, two at the bow, one at the stern. And they appear to be somewhere in the North Atlantic, judging by the terrain. And again, this would have been the kind of ship that would have gone up against the Bismarck in 1942. Not sure if this one itself particularly was involved in that battle. Now those steep cliffs could have been hiding places for German 88s to fire against these if they had had those positions. The German 88s was a very serious cannon that they used on tanks and in stationary positions along the coastal fortifications. The Germans would have built a number of coastal fortifications uh, right away, the Atlantic Wall that was called, in anticipation of any kind of invasion across the channel. I love the detail, the attention to detail with all the houses you can this, it looks like the, that appears to be some sort of a, a church, can't tell. But uh, the detail is great. You can even see bird droppings, come on, this is good stuff. They are taking fire from all directions, whoever this is. They just took a fire below the water line, that's not going to end well. Again, these battleships have ranges of over 20 miles, so a battleship could have been far off with, uh, if they sighted them. Given the coordinates on a map, they could shoot. Note that they're shooting and missing by a fairly decent amount. They could do course correct, fire for accuracy. They would radio in the course correction, and they would refire, depending on the grid location on the map. And so they could get fairly accurate from a long distance without ever having seen anything, calling in those, those shots. They would do that from ship to, uh, to shore positions as well. If they'd have landed on the shore, ah, victory, huzzah. It's the Yamamoto, named after Admiral Yamamoto, who commanded the attack against Pearl Harbor in 1941. One of my favorite quotes from World War II is attributed to Yamamoto. I don't know that it's real or not. It's in the film, Tora, Tora, Tora. At the end of the battle, Yamamoto was said to have said something along the lines of, I fear we will only awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with terrible resolve. Well, that's a great line, very evocative line. I don't know that he ever said it, 
Uh, but it's a great line, and it's an accurate line, too. It's off the Americans enough where they would just, they could roll out 24 hours a day in their factories, and there's the sleeping giant for you. One of the things they didn't knock out at Pearl Harbor was the aircraft carriers that were at sea on December 1941. So while the Japanese did take out a fleet, it was a World War I era fleet uh, that would have had to have been replaced anyway uh, at this level of warfare. The Japanese Navy surprised people in the early stages of World War II, which is absolutely what got Americans, and they had allied with the Germans. The Germans, two or three days later, wound up declaring war on the United States as, uh, as part of their obligation on that alliance. Uh, so the Japanese Navy, they had uh, a sort of rudimentary radar system. We don't have anything like satellite positioning and all the things that we have now that we can, we can read your license plate from outer space. Now, they didn't have anything close to that. And so, yeah, the Japanese Navy, there was some radio chatter going on uh, in, in the days leading up to uh, December 7th, 41, the day of Pearl Harbor. I don't know what that building is there. Uh, that's a strange building for the Pacific, but nonetheless, uh, there was some radio chatter uh, that was leading up to Pearl Harbor. They knew they were up to something, uh, but they didn't know exactly what was going on. Surprises me a little bit because it seems like an obvious target, but that's easy for me to say after the fact. And so they were indeed surprised, but like I was saying earlier, they did not strike, they did not take out the American aircraft carrier fleet, which was out to sea, and the aircraft carriers were going to be the chief offensive weapon in the Pacific during World War II. The battleships worked in supporting roles uh, to the aircraft carriers, and at Midway in 42, when the Japanese aircraft carrier uh, fighter groups got taken out, I mean, that was the end of their offensive capacity in the Navy. So they were on the uh, rolling back from that point forward. Where it lacks in historical accuracy doesn't bother me nearly as much as it might bother other historians, only because when you see things like this, it gets people to buy books, and I am a book freak. It's so meaningful to learn how people actually fought. The stress of combat comes through in many ways to me here. I can feel my heartbeat increase. I can feel my stress levels go up. Thanks, friends. That was another episode of Experts React. Make sure to follow us on YouTube and Facebook and make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to, follow me, Keith Harris, at Keith Harris History on Instagram. Peace.